challenges today. We're still tr up and running around, but if you could try to try to keep the volume down as much as possible, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, thank you. Well, I'm Robin McAdoo, your AIA East Tennessee president for 2015. Um, 2015's a it's a big year. We've got a we've got a whole lot going on. Um, if we could, everybody just stand up for a minute, please, just for one. Just stand up. Yeah. All right, small arm circles to the front. That's, yeah. Okay, now, now to the back. Yeah. Okay, now, now as big as you can without hitting your neighbor. There you go. All right, and to the back. There we go. All right, you can sit down. Is everybody stretched out now? Is everybody ready for 2015? All right. 2015, Knoxville, Tennessee is hosting the state convention. You get to talk to Greg Campbell and John Sanders who are organizing this event. Um, I just spoke with Gene Burr, who's always behind, you know, the best things that happen in our chapter. He has started a repositioning focus that will go along with our, with our, um, with our convention that focuses on architectural journalism. And so what this is doing is trying to improve our relationship with the public, and that's what this repositioning um, effort is all about. So that's going to be a big thing for us this year. Um, architecture Week this year is different than years before, whereas we are aligning with National Architecture Week, which has a lot to do with that repositioning effort that we were just talking about. We're not just focusing on ourselves here locally, but we're trying to align all those efforts with, with national events. Another thing we're doing this year as a, as a concerted effort is really trying to strengthen our relationship with the East Tennessee Community Design Center. We have an ex officio member of our board on their board this year. Josh Wright is going to serve in that position. I served it last year, and it's a, it's a really great benefit for our chapter to strengthen that relationship. We have, uh, we're sharing our one paid employee with the design center, and that's our component executive. And sorry to put you on the spot, Sarah, but <laughs> as you all know, Pat, uh, Pat retired last year, and uh, we, have, we have been fortunate enough to uh, hire Sarah. This is... This is the new face of AIA. Yeah. So some upcoming events I want to make everybody aware of and to, to go ahead and put on your calendar. Um, the Tennessee Day on the Hill is February 25th. Registration is currently open. You can go ahead and go online and register for that. One thing that we're doing this year to improve our awareness before that event is there's going to be a webinar on February the 20th to tell us what the issues are, get us prepared so that when we go to Day on the Hill, we know what to expect. The Grassroots Convention, this is sort of a big national, go to Washington, D.C. and have a, basically a pep rally for AIA. Everybody gets excited, you come back all motivated and you love architecture and you understand how to connect with the community and it's this, you know, it's this great energizing thing. So that's, that's a wonderful thing. I would encourage anyone to make an effort to go to Grassroots. And um, the deadline for hotel reservations is coming up on February the 1st. The convention itself is March 4th through the 6th. So register now, because that's a great thing. You come, back, you come back with a greater understanding of what AIA does. You know, I remember being young and, and thinking that you just go to AIA meetings so that you, you get your CEUs, but it's, there's so much more to that. There's reaching out to the community, reaching out to schools, reaching out to young professionals, and going to grassroots really helps you understand that a lot better. Um, another thing that a lot of times slips through our fingers and is happening actually a little bit earlier this year is the regional award submissions. There is a deadline February 6th to submit your forms, and the deadline for the actual submissions is March the 3rd. This is a great opportunity. We've already got you know, all of our materials, our photography, our, our layouts for the awards that we did for our local projects. Let's everybody be encouraged to take those same projects and submit them on a higher level. Sponsorship. We want to thank again our 2014 sponsors and encourage you to uh, do the same in 2015. 
we're a little late getting our, our information out this year, but if you know a board member or want to contact myself or, uh, or Sarah, just shoot us an email or a phone call and we can send you the information for sponsorship this year. I'm going to ask Michael Senna with uh, UT to come up and make an announcement about TAST while he makes his way up here. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, so if I haven't met you already, my name is Michael Senna. I'm the AIS chapter president at UT College of Architecture and Design. Um, first of all, I would like to recognize Brianna Weaver and uh, all her efforts with what we did. Uh, if you're not aware, we uh, hosted a national conference this past fall in um, Nashville. And it was a huge success. We had about 800 people come from professionals to students. Um, and Brianna was a big part of that. So if you haven't met her, uh, definitely give her a round of applause because. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but the next thing I'm going to talk about, uh, and this is kind of down the road about a month away, um, uh, also sort of rooted within the college, is um, our TAST event, the annual all-college spring thing. Um, this is an annual thing that's been going on for a long time, um, and AIS has a big part in, in hosting and planning it. Um, so this year it will take place the first week of March. Um, one of our big events is actually the uh, kickball tournament, and we always invite alumni and, and um, professionals and everyone to participate in that. I know that this year they're really trying to get uh, a great alumni team, um, you know, to kick all of our butts at that. So. Um, and like I said, this is about a month out, and you'll probably hear from me again before then, um, and, and I'll send some more information through the AIA um, to kind of get to you. But if you have any questions, talk to me afterward, um, and uh, just, I guess, just a heads up, but mark your calendars for the first week of March, and we would love your support and participation. So, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, one other event to remind you of, I think we sent out a notice, but to bring to your attention to uh, further celebrate our relationship with the Design Center, there's a new director there this year, Wayne Blasius, a lot of you probably know him. There is a reception on Thursday evening from 5 to 7 at Patrick Sullivan, the Patrick Sullivan's building down in the old city. Our next chapter meeting is March 24th, and it is here. Mark, put on your calendar again that, it, that we are meeting here, not at the Foundry. And uh, that will be the meeting where our state AIA representatives come and give us an update on state issues. Ashley Cates, our component executive with the state, and Brett Ragsdale is the president. They will be here next month. And without further ado, I will introduce our mayors. We, uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have, have two mayors with, with different personalities that, that really do good work together as a, as a team. So we're... <laughs> Madeline wants to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they obviously both have a common dedication to our community, and I'd like to, to start out by introducing Mayor Tim Burchett. Well, thank you all so much for allowing me to be here, and actually, Mayor O'Hara and I do get along very well, and, um, and I always forgive her when she's wrong. So. <laughs> And thank you all for allowing me to be here. I want to talk a little bit. I've got some notes here to talk about, but I, since you all are getting to have your day on the hill, I suppose you mean the day on the hill in Nashville. Is that correct? I spent 16 years down there. But first, I want to embarrass somebody. I see my buddy Mr. Sparkman back there. Um, his son uh, Chris and I grew up together, ran track together, and now he's a successful, I think he, is winer, he runs a winery. I'm sure there's a fancier name, a venter or something. There's probably a fancier name. I can't think of being a teetotaler. I can't remember. All I remember was his... Chris always had a bottle of Boone's Farm in high school, so he's. <laughs> but I want you to know, Mr. Sparkman, he was taking it away from some of those other kids is what had happened. So um, anyway, actually, um, when I was in the legislature, um, Jimmy Nafee, this might come as a surprise, he, he's a Democrat and I'm a Republican, but we had a really close relationship. He knew my dad at the university. Dad was, of course, charged of student conduct, and I can remember bringing Daddy down there shortly before he died. And, Daddy was in his 80s, you know, he fought in the Second World War, and he, but apparently he still instilled fear into some of the legislators from their days on the Hill. And, and um, 
Of course, Dad handled the um, um, Freshman Honor Society, too, so I'm sure most of y'all probably knew him because of that. that's what you'd tell me in front of your kids anyway. But, but Dad, um, I remember we saw, ran into Nafee one time in the hall, and, Dad, and, Dad, and Jimmy, uh, the Speaker Nafee, looked up at Daddy and said, he said, Dean, he said, uh, he said, I'm just on my way to committee meeting. I'm not, I'm not out here hanging out in the hall or anything. And I thought, well, he still respects him. But, uh, but I remember uh, Speaker Nafee called me one time, and, um, and we, we really did have a good relationship. It's a little different now in Nashville, I think, with the, the parties and everything. There was, a, a, there was a real camaraderie back then. And, um, and the speaker um, called me. It was in, um, Mr. Bartman, where was your son's restaurant? Was it Washington State or is it Washington? Yeah. Where? Seattle, okay, and he called me. That is in Washington State, isn't it, Jesse? Okay, yeah. <laughs> just making sure. Just making sure. But he, he, you know, he'd call me, and I'd see you know, his name, and I'd think, uh oh, I'm in trouble, you know. But I was at home, and we were out of session. He goes, he goes, he goes, Tim, Speaker Nafee. And I said, Hey, Speaker. And I'd always stand up when he'd talk because it always made me nervous because I either I was either probably getting some some uh, road taken up in my district. You know, you always wanting a road, but Nafee, he he threatened to put gravel down, so. And I said, what's up, Speaker? And he said, well, I'm here at a restaurant. He said, I look over here, and I've got this Tennessee cap on. The guy says, y'all from Tennessee? And he says, yeah. And he says, you know anybody in Tennessee? And he says, y'all don't know my buddy Tim Burchett, do you? And it was his son, of course. But oddly enough, at that restaurant, Bill Gates was there eating with a group of people. And so a bunch of drunk Tennessee legislators went up and saw That wasn't the highlight of their evening was they knew somebody from Knoxville. They got to see Bill Gates. And I don't know why I thought of that story. <laughs> But I'm sure Bill Gates, it's probably another reason he's not bringing too much to Tennessee right now because a bunch of hammered legislators were there. And there's a lot of y'all are friends here, but I want to thank you for inviting me here. I want to talk a little bit about my prepared notes. And then if I could, just for a couple of minutes, talk about the legislature and what y'all are going to endure. And I, I told Rohero, I said, this is sort of like I'm going to stick a needle in your finger and throw you in the piranha tank because I don't think I'm going to be able to hang around for the... Um, for the, the Q&A, but she'll do a better job at that. She's more eloquent than I am, and you all pretty much know where I am on most issues anyway. So thank you all so much for allowing me to be here. Of course, you all realize the economy is not great, but it's a whole lot better than it has been. Um, some good news for those of you all that are in construction and development. We have the lowest major metropolitan unemployment rate in the state of Tennessee. It's at 5.1%. And that was the numbers we got in November. Those were the lowest, uh, the latest available numbers. Single, fel uh, single family dwelling permits continue to rise. In 2015, they tell me, is shaping up to be one of the strongest years um, post-recession. I know Washington and everybody, both sides tell us, one side will tell us the recession's over, the recession's not over. I don't know, but when we post a job for a um, part-time library position and we have over 100 applicants, that tells me that that uh, the economy still has some room for improvement. And um, uh, the new home starts, of course, are, are a key economic indicator, shows the economy and can continues to improve. And all this is good, for, of course, for the architecture industry. The best thing I think that government can do for you all is to stay out of the way of development, is to get out of your way, is to let you all do your jobs. And, uh, and all this is, of course, I think, um, is going to be good for this community. Knox County, of course, has one of the lowest property tax rates of all metropolitan counties. Keeping our property taxes low, I believe, is key to encouraging development and growth in the real estate market. Some good news, some things that have happened. Uh, according to Knoxville Chamber's annual report, we've added 3,273 new jobs in Knox County in 2014. More than a half a billion dollars is 515 million in capital expenditures and investments in our community. Wages grew at a rate of 1.5 percent. Some new um, economic recruits, and the trouble with this is these are some things that Mayor O'Hara and I worked on and our offices worked on, but you don't hear about them a lot because there's a lot of fiefdoms. I know you just think fiefdoms are just in Knox County government, but they're statewide. And anytime the state touches a program, they are responsible for the PR of it. And that's probably why you never hear about it, because, you know, they'll make sure they get a glowing editorial in the Tennessean and, and the other, I don't know, other 7 million people in the state that don't read the Tennessean probably don't see that article. But for Cineas Medical, 665 new jobs, $140 million investment. It's the largest in our county's history. And remember, the city is within the county. So 
It's a partnership. Leisure pools, 240 jobs, 6.2 million. Surface igniter, 108 jobs, $3.8 million investment. And just go on down the list. Expansion of, of Knoxville's industry, because that's something that's, that's core to, to our local economy. The Knoxville Locomotive Works, 203 jobs, $6.1 million investment. Ace and Automotive Casting, 81 jobs, $53.8 million investment. I can go on down the list. But there's so many other things that, that have been good for this community. Denso, 293 jobs. I think those are some indicators that what we're doing in this county, that this cooperative that Mayor O'Hara and I share, is doing, we're doing some good things in this community. You're not going to hear about a lot in the news because, honestly, it do, probably doesn't sell papers. Although Andy Griffith is, um, is in about 115 countries and everybody loves it. Everybody watches it. And so I don't understand why good things don't sell, but apparently they don't. Um, and I want to salute you for what y'all do. And I want to salute you also for joining an organization that is very respected in Nashville. As I said, I spent 16 years in Nashville, four years in the State House and 12 years in the Senate. It's very important for you to go down there, but I want you to remember, architecture's day on the hill is just another day on the hill. Remember that. I can remember one year, one day, it was, it was and this is, no, it, this is no exaggeration, I think you all had your day on the hill. It was black minister's day on the hill. It was exterminator's day on the hill, and it was LB, uh, LBGT day on the hill. And honestly, when people would walk in their office, they would start with the same speech or tell me how great I was, and I would have to ask them, which, now which group are you? Because I would not know the difference. When you all go in that office, you're, you're, you have, your lobbyists are well respected and you've, you've got a great presence. But always remember that. And I would always, always, and everybody says, well, hit them with an email. Well, emails were great about the first week in the legislature, but after, you know, and, and it's because, see, I, you won't be seeing much of me in the future because I've got this Nigerian cousin who I've sent all my money to, and I'll be getting a big rebate from that real soon. So, I, and, and that's what I'm talking about. Ele the, e emails were great for about the first week, and then they just get covered up. Handwritten letters, a personal phone call, they have a 1 800 number. I think it's 1 800 449 8366, and then you can hit the extension of what your legislator is. It's so important, and it's so important, too, for you to be a registered voter. You'd be surprised at how many groups that Mayor O'Hara and I go to that people are not registered voters. And all they have to do, it's all public record now, and you just punch in a name in a computer, and you can just, or you can call your courthouse. And two, another thing is, it's always nice to get a handwritten letter from your, le from your folks back home. But if I get a handwritten letter that, and without a doubt, a good group like this, well-meaning, will hand out a, a, a carbon copy or a Xerox copy of a letter that, they, that you should send to your legislators. And I'll get a half a dozen when I was in the legislature that will say, and they'll, it'll say, dear representative or senator, and, you're supposed to, and this is something you're supposed to write in your hand, and they'll take that letter and they'll just circle senator, and then they'll maybe write their name at the bottom of that letter. And you laugh, but a lot of educated groups do that. And it's just a couple of sentences. And, don't, and when you write them, if you do end up writing them an email or a long letter, I think it's a big waste of time. But keep it down to about three or four sentences. Please do that with your legislators. People will write these long, extensive letters, and I'll, and I'll get home with them, and or I'll be reading them, and I'll read the, you know, it'll be three or four pages. And I'll get to the last, and I'll find out that some guy I run into in the church parking lot, or I see him over here at Ball Market number three, eating a chili dog every week. I say, dude, why didn't you just tell me what you were interested in? They, and you don't have to say in the letter, I pay your salary. They, they know that. <laughs> they know that. Um, and uh, always, and, and, and you know, put a phone number in there, follow up with a phone call to them, and thank them for their time. And when you're there, they know what you're there to talk about. But hit your points, thank them for their, their time, and get the heck out. Every time I... And everybody, and to another mistake folks like this will make, well-intentioned, they'll, I want to see the governor. I want to see Bill Haslam. You know, I, I, I know, I've known Bill. My kids played baseball with his kids or whatever. And I'll tell folks, and, and I do that all the time, and unless it's a, a real specific tax issue or something, you want to see the commissioner. Or better yet, you want to see the lady that runs that commissioner's office. And talk to your legislator about that. That's one of the key things. And treat those staff with respect. 
When I first got there, I was one of the youngest legislators in the House, and when I got to the Senate, I was still one of the youngest legislators there. I can remember the first day I walked in my office, and at that time, the House members that since changed, they shared a secretary uh, with two or three. I think Bill Clabo and some other folks, I think we had two secretaries for eight legislators or some eight House members. And uh, I walked in that office, and they said, said, could you make some copies for me? The lady said, and I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be glad to. And I ran, and I said, you tell me where the copier is. And so I walked down the hall. And when I was going down the hall, she about tackled me. And she says, oh, my gosh, I am so sorry. I thought you were an intern. And I said, I said no, ma'am, I'm your new boss. I said, we're going to get along just fine. Don't worry. And, uh, but, but those, remember, legislators are part-time, and those secretaries are full-time. You want to know why Tim Burchett was the most prolific bill passer in the state of Tennessee? Because Tim Burchett was very kind to those secretaries, and he remembered when Valentine's Day was, and he remembered their grandkids' names because they were probably my age, and we remembered things like that. It's about personalities. It's not a, one of the one of the best legislators that was down there was a guy named Shelby Reinhart, who was an old Democrat, and he told me one time he said, "Tim, you don't vote bills, you vote personalities. If a crook gets up on the floor, he knows that you better watch that bill. If it's an honest person, he knows that that person probably has the best." doing what he thinks is right. Always remember that. It's just about personalities. And your personalities are wonderful. You just be yourselves down there, and I think the legislators are going to dig that. So I'm going to stop there. I've talked too long. I've got to get to my next one. Michael's back there getting nervous. So thank you all. If you all have any questions of me, 215-2005. I've taken up too much of Rojero's time. But I do want to say also that um, some, I've got notes here. I should have, I should have looked at them. Um, <laughs> but... Um, Oh, yeah, we are working together. See, right there it says, we're working together to appoint a new MPC director. And, um, and we've, we've worked on several issues. We cut up a lot. And, yeah, our backgrounds are different. And, and you know, her, I don't know her beliefs, and she doesn't know my beliefs, but, but she's an honest person, and, and she thinks I am most of the time. So, and, and yeah, we, you know, our, our politics are, are, diabo are di not diabolically, they're diametrically. That's what happens. <laughs> That's what happens when those Republicans start using those big words, Rohero. I save you the, I save you the, you could, I zing myself. But, but, but our goals are the same thing. It's better government and it's more efficient government. We cut up a lot, but that government, we get along. I respect her. I voted for her. My mama, the last Democrat she ever voted for, maybe the first one since FDR. No, she didn't vote for FDR either. But, um, uh, it was Madeline Rohero. So I want to say thank you for allowing me to be here, Michael. We got a roll. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. We appreciate you being here. And I think he means it when he says, call him with questions. Call, call me. There you go. <laughs> All right, now, without further ado, we'd like to introduce our city mayor, Madeline Rojero. Thank you. Good afternoon. As I've said before, he's always a hard act to follow. <laughs> but we do have a good relationship, uh, work very closely. Our staff uh, works very closely together. You know, every one of my constituents is also Tim Birch's constituent because the city is within the county. So I think it's vitally important that we work together on issues and, uh, and that's something that we have both, uh, our goals have been to make that walk between the, the city mayor's office and the county mayor's office as, as uh, short as possible. So uh, Tim did a great job of, uh, I think, of talking about uh, the legislature. So he's got great experience there, and, and I think that was some really good advice. He also talked about some of the economic indicators uh, for our area. I'm going to focus more on the development that's occurring. And I have to say, it's a little intimidating to talk about development before this group because you all are the ones, you know, intimately involved in it. So I'll probably mention projects that you're doing, and if I make any mistakes, then, then you uh, let me know. <laughs> but I just want to kind of give the overview because I think sometimes when you're, own, when you're in your own world, you don't realize all the rest of the stuff that's going on. And in, in our job, we, we end up uh, seeing and having uh, sometimes a... Uh, connection with a lot of the stuff that is going on in our community. I do want to take a minute to recognize we have uh, one of your members who is our city councilman, Dwayne Greaves. It's always great uh, to be here with Dwayne. 
and uh, also my communications manager, Jesse Mayshark. And Jesse came from Metro Pulse, and he was the type of, uh, of uh, reporter and journalist that really dug into the issues. And, and then really what I'm talking about, what y'all are about, is something that he is very um, strongly, uh, he strongly cares about it and uh, is, does a great job in working with our redevelopment office and the other uh, uh, departments that we have to make sure that we're getting we're communicating as, as well as we can and being as transparent as we can. So I appreciate him, Jesse Mayshark. <laughs> also, another person I want to recognize is my daughter, Joan Monaco, who is here. She is a 2009, we believe, <laughs> graduate of the um, architecture program here at UT. Joan, stand up. <laughs> So we talk about development activity, um, you know, how's it going? The, the, you know, the short way of describing is that there is a lot of dirt moving in our city right now. You know, with the city, uh, you know, we care about the entire city. Uh, we, if you look at our engineering programs, we have capital projects throughout the city. But, but a lot of our redevelopment activity is, has been, is really focused in the inner core. Because as you all know, for years, uh, development went out, went west primarily, and southwest went out into the county. And our, our inner core, our city really started decaying at, at, you know, at, at the core, at the heart of the community, downtown and the commercial strips and the older neighborhoods, the first ring neighborhoods. So for a number of years, really, um, you know, Mayor Haslam, uh, had a big focus on this, uh, Mayor Brown in his interim year, and then in the three years that I've been mayor, we've continued to follow the strategy of, of, of promoting reinvestment where there's been disinvestment and really building out from the, from the center out, uh, really focusing on that. And so, um, because you can't annex like you used to, the laws are changed, and we know that it's not a sustainable community if you have decay in the center. You really have to focus where the built infrastructure already is, where the buildings are there, the beautiful architecture, uh, and uh, where there's already sidewalks and roads and water mains and such. That's really the, the strategic way to do it. And the heart of a community is dying, then the whole community ultimately is dying. So we've got to focus there. So uh, there's a lot of dirt moving, and I'm going to focus more on the inner core of the city and things that y'all are involved in and we're directly involved in as well. If you look at it, major private and public uh, investment is really reaching out in about every direction from downtown. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is University Commons. How many people have been to the University Commons development? The Publix, the Walmart, they are near um, off of Cumberland Avenue. So that is really the largest development to open in the urban core in years. It's about, it was about a $62 million uh, project, or actually the developers, that was the original price. They tell me we wish it was just $62 million, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's, if you look at the design, it's really an exciting uh, urban design, vertical design uh, with parking tucked underneath um, the stores. Uh, the, it was built on an old brownfield site. There had been attempts to build, resi you know, ideally you'd have residential apartments there, right? I mean, you'd have apartments for students right there next to campus. There were too many uh, issues with the brownfield site. So they came in with this development that was able to produce the retail uh, and uh, the parking uh, and such. And, uh, and they could really turn that old brownfield site around. So we provided a TIF for the developers <clears throat> and by the way the tenants are paying premium leases all of the, the 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 city leveraging of resources went to the actual development and dealing with the brownfield site and having to build the big uh, the bridge basically um, up towards campus so to me this is the kind of development that we need to continue again focusing on the inside out adapting and reusing blighted or ne neglected urban properties to create this new economic activity and investment. So University Commons is at the west end of our planned improvements to the entire Cumberland Avenue corridor. Many of y'all have probably been in the public meetings about that. The, um, the road diet, the streetscapes, the wider the sidewalks, all to improve that area, which when you think about Cumberland Avenue, right now, I was talking to one of the fast food uh, uh, joints, uh, the owner saying that 60, I think he said 68% of his business is drive-through. 
Now, that's just mind-boggling when you consider that this is the commercial strip next to a campus with how many thousands, like 24,000 undergrads plus grads plus faculty and staff, so 30, 40, I don't know how many thousands of people are there every day. And yet your commercial strip is primarily drive-through. And so and we know it's not safe and we know the traffic doesn't work. So years ago, the city started on this process of, of redesigning the streets, lots of public process. We have a plan in place. You all know, and we've got the money, uh, well, at least we had the money uh, in place until we realized it's going to cost more. Uh, and so we've tr gone out to bid twice, and uh, one time no bids, second time one bid, really high. So every, every time we're making some adjustments, we're going to go out again, and hopefully we'll get some more competition and uh, we'll be able to move that project forward. We are still 100% committed to that project. We know it's, it's gonna be a good outcome for Cumberland Avenue, key redevelopment. And already in anticipation of that city investment, we are seeing other private investments. Several apartment, one apartment complex is already done for students, another one's been announced. Um, anyway, quite a bit of redevelopment that's occurring there, knowing that this investment's coming in. So, um, so then if you look around downtown, just about every building on Gay Street has now been renovated or is in some stage of redevelopment, some very early, some almost finished. J.C. Penney Building uh, is um, really coming along, and I've been promised a bowling alley in the basement. I'm most excited about that. Uh, downtown bowling will have some challenge, some uh, great little uh, challenges going on down there. Uh, so get ready. <laughs> Uh, just across the street, the old Crest building is moving toward a complete renovation. Understand plans and designs were presented to the Downtown Design Review Board just last week, so hopefully we'll see that moving along. Uh, having those two buildings done will really fill in that block of Gay Street, and those, they have been major gaps uh, for a number of years, and I think that's going to really start to change. You know, the city has, has already done all of, uh, a good portion of Gay Street uh, streetscape improvements, We've got some more to go um, that I guess it's Clinch, uh, Clinch Avenue and, and Church, right? We're going to do those where the lovely uh, rumble strips are. <laughs> not, they're not supposed to be rumble strips, but that's what they are right now. But anyway, so we're going to continue that. But we've done quite a bit of investment um, along Gay Street. And so seeing these buildings fill in is, is going to be great. A little further south from Crest and the J.C. Penney buildings is the old Farragut Hotel that has, you know, for a long time been kind of the holy grail of Gay Street, and it's attracted a lot of interest over the years. It's changed hands a few times, but nobody's been able to pull it together. I've had several developers come in to talk to the city about their plans and, you know, what investment we would make, but now... Um, Rick Dover bought it, you know, a local person who understands the market here, and he has quite a bit of experience converting big old buildings uh, to new uses. And so um, he's talking now about a high-end hotel and some residences perhaps, so we're going to be working with him. We're eager to see what will happen there at the old Farragut Hotel. We're also seeing major new construction downtown for the first time in decades. The Marble Alley apartment complex, you've been watching that go up? It's amazing. That's uh, Buzz Goss and his partners right there between State and Central Streets. And that will really transform that block. The city's putting in some significant street infrastructure to improve the roads and the sidewalks and lighting and such uh, around there. And that's really going to fill in the gap between the old city and downtown, uh, which, is, you know, which will create, I think, more pedestrian movement, more vitality than along Summit, you know, connecting those two retail areas. A lot happening in and around the old city itself. David Dewhurst, is, um, as you know, has uh, renovated the White Lily building, and that's coming online with 46 apartments. That's pretty exciting. John Clark is moving forward with the plans for the John H. Daniel building, uh, which is going to add about 90 uh, new bedrooms. And between those projects and Marble Alley, we're looking at an additional four to 500 new downtown residents within the next few years. And so when you consider that the current total is like 1,500 to 2,000, that's a significant increase in residents uh, downtown, which, which will really have an effect in supporting the, uh, you know, the, the retail uh, and commercial that's down there. 
Uh, and there's more to come. You've probably seen the, that uh, Jenny and uh, Randy Boyd are restoring the Patrick Sullivan Building, which is really a signature architectural building in the old city on that very important corner. And uh, he told me there'll be announcement soon on the, the tenant that'll be moving in there. Just across the railroad tracks here, um, over there, is Eric Olgren's uh, de old depot warehouses and that he's got plans to redevelop that into retail and dining uh, destination. And of course, there's the uh, West Jackson Avenue area between Gay and Broadway, the site of the former McClung warehouses, uh, which is probably one of the biggest uh, opportunities and remaining challenges that we have downtown. City acquired that property finally after years of, uh, uh, of an owner that uh, did not take care of it, did not uh, invest in it. The city finally acquired that property through in, while he was in bankruptcy. And of course, later uh, we lost uh, the buildings to a fire, which was um, very disappointing to us and to many people. But we are dedicated to getting that redeveloped. And, um, and just actually, as a part of that, we invited the Urban Land Institute in last year to study that and several other areas in and around downtown. And probably, how many of you participated in Urban Land Institute forums? Yes, yeah, some people here. Uh, we tried, we had actually a really broad base of people invited in uh, to talk to them so we could get the best of the ideas, a lot of great input on that property. We've also had public meetings about it. Many of you, I think we had one right here actually. And um, anyway, that for us, the Urban Land Institute said this is really the low hanging fruit of those sites that we looked at. It's the one that we really need to focus on first and we want to get it, get it right. So we're gonna be careful about it. Uh, we're waiting for the final Urban Land Institute plan, the final report to actually be delivered to us. But one of the things that they had recommended was that we hire a master developer to manage that whole corridor already some great investment uh, along that corridor with um, where's um, Brandon I saw him here you know your place there you've been there a few years and of course with the new the standard and uh, the development um, right along the other end of it uh, southeastern glass others so uh, we're that's something that we have to make some decisions on how we're going to move forward but it's something that's top on priority for us uh, so the West Jackson property is the rare case where the city is directly involved as the property owner. But I do want to point out that, that there is public involvement in many of these other developments that I've just mentioned. That's mostly private investment, but the city is often a partner in that. And we do, and the county as well. And we do that primarily through uh, the public infrastructure that we build to support it uh, and the tax increment financing and payment in lieu of taxes, the pilots and the TIFs that we provide uh, council with uh, council's approval. Uh, those are really vital tools. The city's been using them since about 2004 and it's really what's helped turn this around. I mean, the private investment drives it, but without those TIFs, uh, those projects would not go forward. In fact, there's, the rules are, but for this TIF, this, this public investment, the project would not happen. And so we are seeing, um, Really, you know, when you look at the major buildings that, that have been redeveloped, like Fire Street Lofts, the Holston Building, the Burwell Building, Southeastern Glass, Daylight Building, Mass General Store, and many more, they probably wouldn't have happened uh, without that TIF. And already, we know that these TIF projects have generated property values, um, by, have, have increased property values by about $50 million, all in our urban core. Uh, and that's not even counting the, Bap the Baptist Hospital site, which is a $165 million project. So not counting that, we've already seen $50 million, the property values increase, which means actually, by the way, all of these TIFs are on the city website. If you look under uh, policy and redevelopment, you can see all of the properties that have received the TIFs. And we show what the increase is uh, with the TIF and what the increase in the property taxes uh, will be uh, both uh, immediately and then after the TIF rolls off how much we will actually uh, realize. And right now with uh, if you look at all the projects that the city's invested in, the yearly increase in city taxes during the TIF period 
is about $335,000. When you look at the city and county, it's $492,000. And then when you look at once it rolls off, which some of these already have, uh, that some of the early projects, uh, the total combined city and county tax increase from this reinvestment is going to be close to two point five million dollars. So our investment, um, the, the public investment, uh, leveraging the private investment, we believe is, has really proven to be a worthwhile investment. Um, let's see. Okay, so the Baptist Hospital, we can get back to that. Have y'all been watching that building come down? You know, my, I look outside my office window and there it is. I'm directly across from it. So uh, if, we don't see, if we don't see them moving dirt, I, I'm, you know, I'm calling the developer. Where are they? You know, let's get this dirt moving. Um, but they are doing a great job. It's, I mean, it's been slower, I think, than they had anticipated, but it's, but it's coming down. And uh, it's going to be exciting, uh, you know, apartments, some uh, restaurant retail, student apartments as well. And... Um, there also, there'll be the, the river walk. You know, the part of the South Waterfront plan is that you have a river walk basically from the one end to the other, three miles of South Waterfront. So their piece of it will be built a public plaza adjacent to where the Henley Street Bridge is, Henley Bridges, and then, of course, their development too. So that's uh, something that we're excited about. On the other end of the South Waterfront, closer to Island Home, the River's Edge apartment complex is uh, moving towards con uh, construction. That will also include moving the road and building a river walk, uh, which will be part of that three-mile river walk, uh, extending from Blunt Avenue uh, to Island Home. Actually, I think before Blunt Avenue passed that. So um, if you're familiar with the South Waterfront plan, this is a plan that's really nine years old. It was started under Mayor Haslam. The whole idea was that the private investment should, should drive the public rather than the public coming in and doing a lot. Right after the plan came out, the recession hit, so we didn't see much. By the way, Baptist Hospital in the plan was going to be Baptist Hospital because there was no, nobody knew that it would be shutting down within a few years. So. Um, as, as we're coming out of this recession and we're seeing the development and the, and the private interest, then we're able to um, implement some of this plan, including we've gone ahead, the city's gone ahead and uh, allocated dollars for the Sutry Landing Park, which is a, a you know, public park that will be really, it's uh, three lots to the east of where Baptist Hospital is. And we're putting in right now, we're uh, putting in roads which will open up the private property for redevelopment, the privately owned property, and then we'll put in Sutry Landing Park. So the dirt's already moving on that. It's going to be a great resource for our community there along the park. And uh, so a little further south from the hospital on Chapman Highway, uh, if you drive by there, we are realigning the entrance to Fort Dickerson Park. Have you ever been to Fort Dickerson Park? It's unbelievable park. Uh, what's, if you, it's right off, right before you get to Woodlawn Pike, on the right, on the on the west side as you're heading south, and it's a bad little entrance to get up there. There's Civil War um, uh, encampment, I guess, up there, and there. So Civil War um, historical uh, monuments and such. But there's also the quarry there at Fort Dickerson. Uh, and you can get to the quarry from the back side on Blount Avenue, or you can get to it, or you can see it from the Chapman side. There's an overlook. It's, it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful part of our city, and most people have never seen it. And most people can't enjoy it because it's just impossible to get into, and it's very dangerous when you drive out. So we put the money into realigning the entrance, sloping it a little better. There's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot prettier coming in. And there was an old... Uh, auto repair store that was right there at the corner and our good friends from the Aslan Foundation bought that property, gave it to the city, we demoed it, and then they're going to actually pay for a, for a beautiful green space uh, park so it'll even be a prettier entrance than, than we could have afforded by ourselves. So that's a wonderful investment. Uh, all of that investment in South Knoxville is really um, enhanced by the urban wilderness. You all know about that, over a thousand acres of land that's mostly public, also, you know, with all connections and easements into the private 
property in order to produce, uh, to preserve uh, for recreation and uh, conservation purposes, thousand acres of our of our South Knoxville, of our ridges, of our trees. It includes Iams Nature Center, 300 plus acres, and Meads Quarry. It includes uh, 10 city parks, the two quarries for Dickerson and Meads. Um, 48, I think, miles of hiking and biking trails. Any bike mountain bikers here? Uh, oh, good, got a few of them. So the mountain bikers, you may know, with their own labor, blood, sweat, and tears, have built 48 or so miles of trails in South Knoxville. Again, a lot on public property, some on private where the owners are granting easements, and it's just changing South Knoxville. We were successful in stopping the extension of the James White Parkway, which means that we, the, um, it won't cut through this beautiful wilderness that is being developed. And the wilderness is an, a recreation destination for us, for our local bikers and hikers. It's also a regional economic asset. It's, it's part of our economic strategy for, strategy for the future. Developing um, that urban wilderness and the hiking and biking trails makes South Knoxville a recreation destination uh, nationally. We've already had a major uh, national adventure race come uh, to South Knoxville because of the assets that we have there. So a lot of that is there's still many more plans and I give credit to Legacy Parks, Carol Evans and her board for really branding and conceiving of that and then working with the Aslan Foundation that's also buying land and preserving it and they bought Log Haven, they bought the the last piece of that Cherokee Trail property that was about to go to development, you know, beautiful ridge top development. They bought that uh, during the recession. Good thing about the recession is all of Cherokee Trail did not get developed. Uh, we were able to preserve the River Bluff area, and Aslan, our legacy parks, bought that, and, um, and so it'll eventually be owned by the city. But Aslan is buying up property. They built out the high ground park. Is that the right name? High ground park. And uh, they're doing beautiful stuff to preserve South Knoxville and Log Haven. Um, and uh, IAMS Nature Center, great partners, and they've got some great announcements that are coming soon, too. So uh, lots of stuff going on there. I'm going to try and, uh, I want questions, so let me, let me just hit a few more things. I'm going to skip some stuff here. Of course, this area here, you know about this. Y'all come here, the Blue uh, Slip Winery next door. Just across the street here, Jeffrey Nash and David Dewhurst are making major investments along Depot and West Magnolia. Rick Dover's team is going to remodel Old Knoxville High. Happy Holler, that just keeps going. Uh, some new vintage shops are there. Um, new restaurants coming in, Three Rivers Market, Magpies, Holly's Corner, great things happening there. East of downtown, a lot of properties being bought up, uh, the old property. Um, blighted property, there's some new owners coming in, and the city is redesigning Magnolia Avenue. You know, Magnolia Avenue is like a huge, let's say, opportunity. <laughs> it's, there's so much uh, that can be done along there, and there's so much reinvestment that needs to occur. We're starting at the lower end in the Magnolia Avenue Warehouse District. We have a model block, it's really four blocks, uh, basically from the, from, the, from the end or the beginning of it. Uh, to um, past uh, Knoxville, the old Catholic High, the Magnolia Campus for Pellissippi. And so we're, we've had some public meetings about the new design, the streetscape, the wider sidewalks, the boulevard, and um, we'll be moving to the next phase, the uh, design uh, and, and then construction phases for that. Historic preservation is a key to all of this, and I know looking out on the room, we've got, uh, that's what y'all are about, a lot of lovers of, of historic preservation here. And um, one of the things that um, I proposed this year and council approved in the budget was setting aside a, a, a new historic preservation fund. We have a lot of programs through community development that address this and a lot of the TIFs and all the stuff I've already mentioned really serve to support historic preservation or our old buildings. But we have a special half a million dollar fund that started this year uh, for specific projects that need gap financing that need some help to make them happen that may not fit into these other categories. And uh, so right now we're collecting applications or proposals for that. So check out our website if, if you're interested. We also um, asked city council, I took to our council and they uh, sent to MPC a proposal for a demolition delay ordinance um, that would delay up to 60 days um, 
any demolition permit for historic structures. It, it, the whole purpose is to give time. We worked with Knox Heritage on this. The whole purpose is to give time. If somebody says they want to demo a building, require the 60-day uh, process where people have an opportunity, preservationists, whatever, have an opportunity to talk with the owners to see whether there is a way that this building can be uh, saved. So similar to something they have in Nashville. There'll be a council workshop on that uh, Thursday, February 12th. Uh, so if you need more information, let me know. Uh, finally, um, well, and then there's things like the soccer complex. Have you seen that for our kids that, that's being built? This is a private investment. Um, his name, uh, thank you, Bill Sansom. We all know Bill Sansom. He basically has donated, it's probably like a $6 million donation of, of, of property and construction and development right there at 17th and, and basically I-40. Thousands of kids uh, through the Emerald Youth Foundation will have access to these beautiful, this beautiful soccer complex, and that's being built right now. It's, and, and the city put in, I don't know, 800 and some thousand, I think, of sidewalks and, and uh, street lights and some road improvements to, to uh, leverage and support that development. Along Clinch Avenue Bridge, right between the Convention Center and the Holiday Inn, we are, we've got plans and have funded uh, streetscapes for that bridge to make that link between uh, downtown and uh, the Convention Center and Fort Sanders to really make that uh, much more attractive. And we are, in order to help the Convention Center business, we're putting a walkway, a covered walkway between the Convention Center and the hotel. The old state office building has uh, been bought by uh, Nick Kazana, who owns the Ho Holiday Inn. That'll, go, that'll become another hotel, again, helping the convention center. And we're reworking the, uh, the bridge over Henley Street to get people over there. So lots of projects. Working with the U.S. Green Building Code, uh, Council approved the International Green Construction Code last year as a voluntary code. Uh, we felt like, uh, given just the nature of politics and reality here in Knoxville, you, it couldn't be mandatory. <laughs> uh, we made it voluntary and we're really looking for you all to, uh, to find some projects, to, to find a developer or whatever who would be interested in, in uh, following those codes and so we can get some, exper uh, some experience and practice with that and, and um, see how it works. Uh, we want pioneers to really make us a sustainable city, so we hope some people will step up. And finally, Mayor Burchett talked about the economy, and it's not where we want it to be, but it's getting better. And I do want you to know that last week, the Brookings Institution released a report that ranked Knoxville 99th among the world's 300 largest metro economies for economic performance in 2014. So looking globally, looking at 300 metro areas, the top 300 for economic performance, we were 99. Uh, that's based on GDP per capita and changes in employment. Um, it says, uh, and I guess last year we were eight, 183rd out of these 300, we moved up to 99. It says um, that Knoxville is actually doing significantly better than its southern counterparts. Um, and we say that usually metropolitan areas from the south and the west coast are doing better than the national economy. The report pegged Knoxville's employment growth rate at 2.4 percent compared to 1.6 percent nationally, and our income growth was at 1.2 percent. So that's good news. It's, uh, we're, on the, we're on the right track. Hopefully you all are getting, you are feeling the effects of that. Hopefully you can realize that that's happening through your businesses. So I'm going to stop there. There's actually a lot of projects I didn't mention. <laughs> but uh, if there are any questions, if we still have time, I hope, to, uh, for questions, I'd be glad to take them. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think we have all felt the effects of that. <laughs> And, uh, and because we have all felt the effects of that, our, our chapter this past year uh, recognized Madeline as a friend of architecture. And Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind to bring that up here, we'd like to present that, present that to you. And that's because we, we recognize the, uh, under your leadership, the city has truly uh, made healthy development with an eye on sustainability, with an eye on historic preservation. And we realize that those things wouldn't have happened without your, without your strong leadership and dedication. So we want to present this to you. Thank you. Actually, do you mind if I read the inscription? Oh, go ahead. Okay. 
um, I just wanted to share, many of you may have heard this in, in October when we had our annual um, Design Awards event in this building, actually, but um, this, was a, this is an award that's presented to a non-architect for their contributions that have supported um, architecture. And I believe um, Elizabeth Eason actually wrote the nomination, um, put, putting your name forward. Um, but this award is presented for a distinguished career and its unyielding support for our profession. As mayor of the great city of Knoxville and through your previous accomplishments as a planner, a leader of community development efforts, your advocacy for healthy neighborhoods, sustainable development, and civic engagement have significantly improved the quality of life for those in our region through design. Your dedication to issues of the built environment continues to raise the public's awareness of the importance of architecture and design, and we salute the lasting impact of your work. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And we're a little over on time, but I want to invite any questions. Oh, well, I, uh, very positive, you know, we had very positive response to ULI. It's a challenge on, um, for example, with the Henley Street, I think everybody would like to see that um, connection, you know, kind of the slowing down of traffic, the connection, how you do that when, uh, when TDOT uh, controls, uh, when it's a TDOT street and it's a main thoroughfare coming in, you know, the issues coming in. People are speeding off the interstate. There's a lot of challenges to it, but um, is it something that we would love to see? Yes. How you know we have to set priorities. Um, is it you know some things are more feasible than others? Let's put it that way. And so I think we start where um, the low-hanging fruit is, like I mentioned earlier, with uh, really focusing on Jackson Avenue um, and um, the Civic Coliseum. Uh, you know their idea was basically. You don't need it there. Move it closer to downtown. Uh, we are actually having, we have a separate study looking right at the Civic Coliseum of uh, those who work with Civic Coliseums and understand what makes them work. You know, what market might we be missing because we don't have the kind of facility we need. So we're actually looking at that from two different angles. And I'll tell you, there's other issues too, which they didn't speak to directly, but when you look at the safety building there where the police department is, we actually, um, we actually need a better, a new and improved, or at least an improved safety building. Police and fire, it started out where they were together years ago when that was built. Um, with growth and all, fire department isn't even in that building anymore. It's, it's in really bad shape. Uh, just, I have to tell you, I'm one that believes in infrastructure. It's not the sexiest thing, you know, it's not, uh, you know, we, we cut the ribbon on Prosser Road, okay, well. <laughs> Anybody who got stuck in the flooding really understood that, but a lot of people, it's like, okay, really, you're cutting a ribbon for a road? Um, but that's the kind of stuff that we have to do, and that's where across this country, it's easy to ignore that. You know, it's easy for politicians uh, to elected officials to ignore the infrastructure because it's very costly and it doesn't have the same pizzazz. But I know that it has to be done. I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we're tackling those. So we're doing the public works complex uh, for th that the city, um, our public service department and, and others are in. And that's a new um, development, the $15 million development. And one of the next, and two of the next big things we need to look at in terms of infrastructure, uh, city owned infrastructure and facilities are the safety building uh, for police and fire and the Civic Coliseum and Auditorium. So, um, you know, we're very excited about the ULI coming in. We will sit down when we get the final report, which we haven't gotten it totally. You know, they do kind of a flash uh, presentation and then they go back and, and rewrite it and, and kind of where they might have gotten some bad information, incorporate that in because they're doing a lot in a few days. And so when it comes back, we'll take a look at it. But we're very open to what they say, and it's just a matter of figuring out priorities and feasibility of each of those ideas. Other questions, comments? Push back. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
Well, the fact that it's um, pro uh, public now means that we ultimately control what happens there. You know, um, if it's for where there are privately owned properties, we don't have as much say, you know, in the, in the final outcome, you know, sometimes very little. Pardon me? Well, uh, I actually, I don't have a predetermined, she said, what would I like to see happen at, at Jackson Avenue? The part of this whole process to figure out what is best for the community, what does the market, you know, what will the market bear, where are, what are the needs? We already have a very creative corridor there on Jackson Avenue with, uh, you know, Sanders Pace and, and uh, some of the other developments there. Uh, I'd like to see something that, that increases the vitality of what's there. It's a great link between the old city and um, the World's Fair Park and on to the university. So certainly we want a development that's going to provide those kind of linkages. But most likely some kind of mixed use. Um, but that'll all, you know, you've got to look at the market. You gotta, when you finally put it out for proposals, we'll see what uh, the interest is from developers. We'll see what what they think the market is calling for, but we'll continue to have the public process to make sure that we're hearing from those uh, in the community who have an idea about this. But I, I don't have a preconceived notion other than it needs to add to the old city, the downtown, and continue that uh, creativity and uh, the vitality of that area. Yes. So the question is about, is my commitment to infrastructure include repaving the, the roads? Yes. We put, I uh, forget how much each year, uh, into repaving roads. There's actually a, every road is um, judged, you might say, based on the type of road it is, the amount of traffic it gets, and then it's on a cycle for when it gets repaved. Uh, so, um, and then when there are potholes, or there is other kind of, of develop uh, something that happens and it might move that up. If you have a uh, particular, and remember on some of the problems, there's some other kind of development going on. For, so say we, somebody tears it up for a development and then we know KU, or KUB tears it up for something and then we know it's gonna get torn up again for the next phase of the development, then it's liable to be a little rough in between there because you, want to, you don't want to spend all your money in a perfect repaving and then just tear it right up again. So we try to coordinate with KUB. But if you see particular problems, please call 311 uh, so that it gets on the list and then our folks go out and look at it and then decide they understand what's going on you know, around the, and whether it's something that needs to be paved now or whether it can go into the regular routine. But that is something that we do every single year. We have a paving contract, and then we do the potholes and, and special things that occur uh, routinely as well. Other questions, comments? All right, well, again, I want to thank you uh, for this award. Thank you for inviting me here today. I have to say that not only do I talk about this kind of stuff at work, but with uh, a daughter in architecture, a sister in architecture, my son is a planner, my husband's an engineer and construction manager, and then we have a welder, and then we have somebody whose business is to deliver babies, so we, we, get, we, can, we can cover all your needs here. But um, this is something that, uh, what you all do is something that we are, uh, as a family, actively involved in and really care about as well. So we appreciate the work that you all do. You all keep challenging us, that's what we want. <laughs> Um, you all do a good job of it. Some of you in this room better than others. <laughs> Keep challenging us because uh, we want Knoxville to really to develop the best it can. Uh, we want to see good, sustainable, responsible development. And I know that's what y'all are committed to. So we appreciate you as partners in that process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. We appreciate you being here and, and for giving us such, such inspirational words and giving us an update of all, of all the great things that are going on. Um, I'll let everyone go. I'll just say one more time, uh, day on the hill, do it. Grassroots convention, do it. Renewal of your dues, do it. <laughs> and that's it. Peace out. <laughs>